introducing Derek McKenzie, who is an associate professor uh, from the Soil Plant Relations Lab at the University of Alberta, not too far from here. Dr. McKenzie's presentation is called Making Soil Health a Working Concept in Alberta, and his credentials on this topic speak for themselves. Derek has over 20 years' experience in soil science, and over the past five years, Dr. McKenzie has developed a keen interest in agriculture, soil health, research, and received $1.5 million in funding to examine baseline soil health in Alberta. So he's really focusing, you saw in my presentation, the importance of, of uh, soil in the very beginning. This is what Derek's really focusing on. Uh, he's also looking at uh, regenerative practices such as compost fertilizer and uh, rotational grazing, uh, which may increase carbon sequestration um, and reduce greenhouse gases. Sorry. I'll get there eventually. Dr. McKenzie operates the 3,000 square foot soil wet chemistry facility located in the University of Alberta, uh, North Campus, and the Soil Plant Relations Lab has the capacity to measure the many different below ground processes that are mediated by plants and microbes with cutting edge technology including bioavailable nutrients, nutrition, soil organic matter, stability, soil black carbon content, microbial uh, structure and function, and rhizosphere polysaccharides. Saccharides, I get that right. Anyway, welcome Derek. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, and thank you for having me here today. Um, you know, it's really funny to, you know, when those bios, they're written in the third person, but they're always written by the person they're about. And it's so weird to write a bio for yourself like that. Because, I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, I don't know, some pompous bigwig from the University of Alberta. And that's absolutely not how I want to come across. So I tell my students, I teach Introduction to Soil Science, and I tell my students at the beginning of the year, you can call me Professor McKenzie until you ask me a, a good question, and then you can call me Derek. And so I just want to say to you guys, just, just call me Derek. I don't go for the formalities of doctor or professor that much. So. Yeah, so I'm here to talk today about the research that my lab is doing and, and the idea of making soil health a working concept in Alberta. And I'll just give you a little bit more background on myself. I uh, am a soil scientist by training and an ecosystem ecologist. And up until very recently, I've been applying that uh, expertise to forest soils that are disturbed by natural disturbance such as wildfire or human disturbance such as uh, mining and land reclamation in the oil sands. And five years ago, I was given the opportunity, I was invited to collaborate on a project with some researchers at uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge, feeding biochar to cattle to see if it could reduce methane emissions and improve cattle health. And then taking, my part of the research project was to take manure-loaded biochar and do soil testing on that, to do um, biogeochemical um, soil plot research on crop growth. Um, and it was really interesting. And so I've kind of never looked back. And I, 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 I say this all the time. I wish that I had spent all of my career in agriculture because working with producers like you guys and working in this industry is a lot more fun um, and more equitable than working with uh, oil sands or big oil and gas producers. So oil and gas producers don't really want to change um, their operations. Uh, they might say they do, but they, and when it comes down to making new recommendations and research them, they don't really want to change. And where I find agricultural producers are really want to be on the cutting edge of new technology and best management practices um, that improve their bottom line, but also improve soil health. So, um, so this work is going to be the collaboration of myself and, and many others that I'll acknowledge at the end. And so I'm in the Department of Renewable Resources, Faculty of Agriculture, Life, and Environmental Sciences at the University of Alberta. And we'll just start with what is soil health. Um, so this is a, a contemporary topic, and but maybe a contentious one with lots of definitions. And the definition that I like the best is that soil health is a metaphor for soil function, which is postulated by Henry Yans and again from the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada um, Institute. Uh, and so therefore, a healthy soil provides water and nutrients for plants, provides habitat for diverse community of organisms, stores carbon, and filters water. So those are just some of the functional practices of soil health. Um, 
So it varies by sector and region. And so in Canada, that includes agriculture, forestry, oil and gas from coast to coast and in the north. And so, yeah, soil health is not just an agricultural concept. It's, it's really all soils across the country. And, and some of the soils in the north and wetland soils are probably the most at-risk soils due to climate change. And so soil health is going to be an important concept across all sectors. It's measurable, but we need consensus on how to do this and what to do with the data. Um, and we need more data in Canada and globally on soil health. And so I'll talk a little bit about what I think that means about coming to consensus on soil methods. But I think you guys probably would all agree that if you ask two different soil scientists how to measure a soil property, they, they'll probably give you different answers, right? And so we need consensus. It's, it's like human health. There's a reason why your, your doctor measures your blood pressure while you're sitting down, not standing up or lying down. Because if you're standing up or lying down, it's different. It's going to give you a different value from if you're sitting down. So globally, the medical industry has come to consensus on how to measure blood pressure. We need to do the same thing um, with soil health. And finally, you know, it's most likely easier to maintain than it is to recover. And so, you know, in, in Western Canada, we're blessed with having very high functioning soils, very productive, very fertile soils. Um, but, you know, the, the evidence in literature suggests that they won't stay like that if we don't um, manage them uh, with health in mind. And so, just like human health, Soil health is probably easier to maintain a healthy soil than it is to recover a healthy, uh, a healthy soil, although recovery is possible. And uh, I work with a farmer in the Edmonton region called Shorty Fenske, who is possibly this soil health equals human health. He's got a whole t-shirt campaign going that I really like. So why should producers care? Well, I think, I think you guys already do. I think because you guys are good stewards of the environment, some of the original proponents of, of agricultural sustainability, I think most producers already do care about um, being good stewards of the environment and therefore care about soil health. Um, um, but I think you, you guys probably want people to show you how it's going to impact your bottom line positively and how it's going to be uh, a useful practice to engage in. Um, so, it, you know, does it actually represent opportunities to increase economic output? So is there a carbon economy is developing that will pay for carbon sequestration? So Chris Patterson mentioned that earlier today that um, you know, you know, I was sort of surprised to hear that he, they've been talking about a carbon economy since 2004 in Alberta. So that's 18 years later, we don't have it. But I think he's right that there is more and more interest moving in that direction because you always have large scale emitters like oil and gas. And so um, in agriculture with, with carbon sequestration, you should be able to be paid for the work you're doing. Um, the shift in markets, so more consumers want sustainable production. Um, and I think because producers want to be part of the solution to climate change. So soil carbon and storage has massive potential. And so if you haven't already seen the, the, the Netflix documentary, Kiss the Ground, I highly recommend it. It's narrated by Woody Harrelson. It's all about regenerative agriculture and climate mitigation. And, and it's a great uh, popular media piece. Um, and the shifting demand for products with tracking from farm to table. So what I'm going to do, the next part of what I'm going to do is describe... Um, what my lab, the Soil Plant Relations Lab at the University of Alberta, is doing in this soil health space. And like I said, I'm very new to this space, um, but I really like working in it. And I, I can see um, there's, there's so many people sort of uh, in Alberta, nationally, globally, working in this soil health space. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a great space to be in right now. Um, but I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a producer, I'm not a farmer. I don't have very much agricultural experience. And so what I'm really here to do today is to make partnerships with you guys and to, select, and to uh, seek collaboration with you so that if I, uh, to do the right thing, to, to be able to generate data and research results that's useful to you directly in your day-to-day -day practices. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so if I say anything wrong or if I, if my opinion is misled in any way, please just share uh, your opinions with me because uh, I'm here to solicit feedback. So my work in the, in the soil health space is broken up into three phases. Phase one, we looked at a soil quality monitoring project where we're really just trying to accumulate baseline data on soil quality across the province of Alberta. Phase two, we're working on... Uh, the DASH DIRTS Health app, so, the, so DASH stands for the Database on Alberta Soil Health, and the DIRTS is, is supposed to be an app to um, help with, to help determine what the current state of your soil health is and potential management practices to increase that. So it's database assembly 
and analysis. And phase three is regenerative agricultural practices and experimental data. So trying to generate more data to show how certain agricultural practices might be best management practices for sequestering carbon or more carbon. So I'm gonna go over some of the details of all three phases of the, all of these phases, um, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Phase one, soil quality monitoring project. So this project was started by the government of Alberta in 1997, and they collected soils for every year until 2007. So they have 10 years of soil sampling data. They collected soil samples from one to two farms in every ecoregion, so there's a total of 44 total benchmark sites, two soil depths, zero to 15 and 15 to 30 centimeters, or zero to six and six to 12 inches, and I'm trying to convert my, my agricultural partners to, to a metric system, so I actually went as far as to print out a conversion sheet and laminate it and give it to him for like, to, like with the idea that he'd keep it in his tractor. I don't know if he does or not, but, um, but I can try to switch back and forth you guys, okay? So uh, measure, they, in this project, they, for these 10 years, they measured soil physical chemical properties, including bulk density, texture, total carbon, nitrogen, salinity, sodicity, pH, cation exchange capacity, base saturation, all the sort of classic soil testing parameters. And they surveyed producers on management practices and yields. Um, and over this course of this sampling period, they archive samples from each collection. So they have three to 4,000 500 milliliter jars of soil. And this is what got me really excited about this project, was that that archive of soil samples represents a gold mine for reanalyzing carbon stability today. So you can't really say very much about carbon sequestration and carbon stability in the soil just from elemental total carbon data. You, you need to look at it in more detail. You need a fingerprint of organic matter quality to be able to say whether or not your, your carbon that you're storing in the soil is gonna be there for a long time or not. And you can do that from archived soil samples. These are air-dried archived soil samples. Um, and so in 2019, we applied for funding and we resampled these sites and we added some indicators of soil health, including carbon stability, microbial diversity, and invertebrate diversity. And so just if you're ever wondering what 4,000 jars of soil looks like, this is it. They're basically stacked three deep on, there's 11 pallets of this. Each pallet probably weighed a ton or, or, or more. Uh, and I never, and so we had to move these soils from downtown Edmonton, our archive, their archive with the government, we moved them to uh, the Breton plots in Breton, Alberta to uh, University of Alberta storage facility. And I never wished I had, had steel-toed boots on more than this day. And I, I went out and bought steel toe boots the day after, right? Because this is just, this was like a safety hazard. Um, and so we, these are the uh, sampling sites. Um, basically, they're, they're, they go from the Peace region all the way down to the border of Montana. And, and you know, if I, and the, the graph on the top left sort of shows you concentric rings. So 100, 200, 100 kilometers in green, 200 kilometers in red, 300 kilometers in blue. and so. Anything 200 kilometers and less is a day trip, and anything over that is, is more than a day trip. And so I had um, you know, graduate and undergraduate students collecting, resampling these sites. And, and so logistically, it was a lot of work. There's a lot of traveling, a lot of time involved, a lot of logistics to get samples from such a vast region. And so that's why I really want to engage in partnerships to try to um, make that acquiring soil samples a little easier. Right, so we, we collected soil samples and then, and then I'm just gonna run through a couple different parameters that we looked at. So this is preliminary data from this project. So we resampled these sites in 2019, 2020, and we're still working on the data. And so one thing I, will, I wanted to add to my talk today is that uh, at the university, we're not a professional research institution. We're, we're a research training facility, right? And so um, while I'm a research scientist, my graduate students are not. They're, they're basically trainees or interns, right? So graduate student is like a, a paid internship and they're learning on the job. And so it, it takes us a while to process the data. We're not as fast as say somebody like the Canadian Forest Service or um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. But it's interesting, the data here, so this is just soil organic carbon change through time and what it tends to show is um, a bit of an increase in total carbon over time, and that upward trend is most likely the result of no-till practices across the province. 
Um, we can look at things like bacterial diversity, and what we see here is that both ecoregion and agricultural practice influence soil physical chemical variability, and so where the bars have different letters, it means that they're significantly different from each other. Um, and so bacterial heterogeneity followed a similar pattern of physical chemical variability. So even though there's variability over the entire province, if we just look at practices, so in the bottom graphs are high, low, and no tillage, there's still a significant difference there under management practices. So not only are there you know, eco-regional differences, which are associated with climate and soil type, but there's also practices are having an effect on um, bacterial diversity. And then the mesofaunal diversity, soil invertebrates are these things. These are water bears or tardigrades, basically microscopic insects in the soil. And again, it, it, the, the results show the same thing. The soil invertebrate distribution varies significantly by ecoregion, and we're still working on how soil invertebrate diversity is affected by management practices. But it most likely is, like the bacterial community is, is affected. Um, mesofaunal are probably affected as well. And the last thing that we're trying to do is look at um, soil fractionation and carbon stability. So like I said before, it's not possible to really get a good handle on long-term carbon sequestration just from total carbon data. Because total carbon data just represents elemental carbon in the soil and it doesn't, talk, doesn't tell you about how stable that carbon is. It doesn't tell you what form, what molecular form the carbon's in. It doesn't tell you if it's associated with aggregates or if it's associated with mineral material. And that's basically the change in concept of soil carbon sequestration. So without going into this graph in too much detail. The point is, is that we no longer look at soil carbon stabilization as a function of humification. Humification is sort of a, a, the old theory of carbon stabilization that is, that is currently being ch challenged and thrown, thrown out. And the new theory of carbon stabilization in soils has to do with physical protection in aggregates, um, mineral associated protection, so carbon that's associated with mineral surfaces protected from degradation, and chemical or the size of the molecule as protection. So we have chemical protection, aggregate protection, and mineral associated organic matter. And so we don't have humic, fulvic, and humic, and human are not compounds that exist in soil that any microbe would ever encounter. What they encounter is our carbon molecules, and any carbon can be degraded fully to CO2 unless it's protected in aggregates or minerals. And what this kind of work shows us is that this is an example of work that's gonna be done in the future on these samples, and these treatments here include biochar and manure, which had an effect on soil organic carbon stability. So that first project I was talking about a little bit, but, but basically what this is is a, a spectroscopic technique to identify a fingerprint of soil organic matter quality. And what I think we're gonna see in the future more and more, and we already had a talk earlier today um, from uh, uh, Chrysa Labs about remote sense data or data that's sensed in situ but with spectroscopic techniques. So looking at light quality reflected from organic compounds and it gives us a fingerprint of the quality. So you can see that there's lots of variation in this fingerprint data between the different treatments. Okay, and so that's our sort of baseline data. And once, now that we have all this data, and, and so this is a, a, a big thing for precision agriculture, I believe, is that more data is better, and precision ag is, is gonna generate a lot of data. We need a way to compile this data and to make it useful for everyone. And so that's phase two of our project is a database for Alberta soil health, or the DASH. And basically we received funding earlier this, uh, in January 2022 from Alberta Innovates, SAFDEC pro program, SAFDEC stands for Smart Agriculture, Food, Digitization, and something, something. It's, it's a strange acronym. I never can remember the ending of it, but uh, sustainable um, agricultural food production to create a soil health database and an app for management. So we received a, a data transfer agreement and a material transfer agreement from the government of Alberta in spring of this year to use the data from the original SQMP study, so 10 years of data from that, plus our data that we collected from that in 2020. Um, and we also moved earlier this year, that's when we moved that archive of soil samples to Breton so that we can start using, start acquiring this carbon stability data from those samples. Um, so we're working with data scientists at the University of Alberta to bring soil scientists, to bring soil science into the 21st century with big data. And so big data in agriculture is, is, a, is, a, is a popular topic. I think people are talking about it all the time. And, and really the question is, um, I was having a conversation at the table at lunch. I think the question is probably not so much the value of the, the, the monetary value of the data, but the, data, the value of the data for the whole um, production system, for all producers to be able to sort of assess 
what their practices are doing to their soil health and how to manage that. And so working in conjunction with others to contribute this data eventually to a national soil database. Um, and so why is a database needed? Soil surveys since the 1920s, physical chemical parameters tell us about soil quality, um, which also you know, it could add knowledge of potential function. And if we add sort of more functional parameters like carbon sequestration and stabilization and microbial function and diversity, um, they, would tell, they would be important for management. Um, and this data exists in the public domain, but has not been digitized. So we have, you know, you know almost 100 years of, of soil data that's sitting in, you know, hard copy books on shelves or in digital archives. It's not centralized and it's not really accessible. Um, so therefore, it's not accessible or easily to be used. And modern communication and machine learning make big data essential for management or an essential tool for management because we can use a database to establish baselines and then we can, uh, as we input new data from new best management practices, we can use the database as a means of determining change to local soil health. Um, and there's a need for data or global data on uh, agricultural soil health to determine if soil management can mitigate climate change. So it, right now it's a, it's a strong theoretical framework, but we need data to, to prove this, right? So everything that, um, every, every way that I want to engage with producers is through, you know, scientific evidence and data to support the theoretical framework. So where's the data coming from? The data is coming from government data archives, publicly funded, therefore the database will be in the public domain. Ideally, the, the database will be in the public domain. It'll be accessible to, to individual producers, but depending on how user-friendly it is or potentially their IT knowledge, they may want to consult with other people to help them produce management practices. Um, historic soil survey data, we'll use data mining. Uh, Pre-disturbance and environmental impact assessments from, from mining, we'll use, we'll use data mining there. And data sharing agreements with soil testing labs. So we're working with uh, soil testing lab elements in Edmonton and hoping that we can get access to all of their historic data. Um, and, and also data sharing portals will be on, a, on the website for this project um, where we're hoping that producers see the value of sharing data so that everyone benefits from that knowledge. And so how do we measure soil health? So it's complicated, right? So there's a need for global consensus on quantification. Like medicine, we need methods that work everywhere um, and are reproducible. And so one way to do this would be something like the Cornell Assessment of Soil Health, or the CASH, which is, on, the, I didn't choose those acronyms on purpose, I promise you, so the CASH dash is not a thing, but. Um, but, you know, the, so the Cornell assessment uses um, physical parameters, biological parameters, and chemical parameters, and all the parameters that they quantify are very easy to quantify. There, any soil testing lab could do this, and so, and eventually if we have enough spectroscopic data, we could use all of this sort of wet chemistry data from, from soil testing labs to um, create models for the um, spectroscopic data. Um, and this, the data, the idea of the data is that it's based on scoring factors with regional applications determined from the dash. And so these scoring factors on the, on the right could either be, you know, it's better with an increasing number, it's better with, a, uh, or a lower number is better, or a number in the middle is better. And so these kinds of scoring parameters would be based on regional um, applications. And so this assessment, the Cornell assessment right now is designed for a sort of northeastern United States. And so their scoring factors are based on the types of soils that they have there and the types of management of the crops that are growing there. And so aren't sort of um, comparable to what we're doing in Alberta. So we need these, you know, regional um, scoring factors that are theoretically would be provided by the database. And so then the cache data streams, um, these are a bit hard to see here, but they're, they're really straightforward things in physical, like water content, surface hardness, uh, subsurface hardness, aggregate stability, biological, they look at things like organic matter content, um, soil protein, soil respiration, and active carbon. And for chemical, they look at fertility testing, pH, and, and um, availability of, of nutrients. And so really easy to measure. There's a couple add-on measures that are also easy to measure, but from these, we sort of generate in, uh, scoring factors from all of these. And then based on the scoring factors, we get an output here, like this is a fictional output that shows that this particular soil is doing very well in sort of its chemical uh, indicators, 
but it's doing sort of fairly poorly in its biological and physical indicators. And so in the bottom, you can see that the overall quality of the soil came out as medium, or a medium soil health. Um, and so then we're trying to, um, basically we're trying to, part of this project is also to design an app for managing soil health and digitally integrated resource technology for soil health, or the DIRTS health. Regionally specific inventories of soil health based on the cash method and the dash to date I think we'll be able to produce soil quality inventories just because I don't think we have all of the soil health data that we need to do this. Um, but uh, management plans that increase soil health while maintaining the bottom line is the goal. So ideally in the future, once you get your sort of soil health output um, from, the, from the app, um, you would be able, the app would also be able to give you best management practices based on your next year's crop rotation in that field for um, management practices that would target those problem areas. Maybe they're regenerative ag practices or maybe they're less synthetic, more organic or compost fertilizer, um, things of those nature. But we need more experimental data on management practices. So we need more data including plant productivity, soil science, rotational grazing, alternate fertility management, and economics. And so this is just a, a mock-up of what this site would be so that you would, um, it would be a web-based web platform where you would input your data and then so there'd be data input portals and data output reports as well. So phase three is sort of regenerative agricultural data. Uh, we received funding again earlier this year from the Results Driven Agricultural Research uh, funding program to work with producers on alternative fertility management. And so the city of Edmonton is collecting source separated organics and distributing it while distributing the excess SSO around the perimeter, city perimeter for use in composting. And so the city of Edmonton can't process all of the SSO that they collect. And so they sort of subcontract it out um, around the city to smaller compost producers and, and from there it can go out to agricultural producers. And so I'm working with a group in Westlock that are composting this material with various other waste streams for use in crop production. Um, and we need data to show which blends might increase soil health while maintaining productivity of three different soil types found in central Alberta. So right now we're just working around Edmonton, but you know I can see this work expanding out and covering Alberta and you know all of Canada eventually. So the compost blends that we're looking at are SSO from the city of Edmonton, Alt Root Composting in Westlock is the compost producer. So they're, they have, they're renting land at the Westlock Recycling Depot, which is actually a really progressive recycling depot for a small rural community. Um, and so Alt Root has land there. I think they have a 40-year lease on land to do this composting. Um, so it's all outdoor pile turning and composting. They're using SSO from the city of Edmonton and they're mixing it with wood residues from Alpac, wood ash from DAP Power, gypsum from cement production and biochar from a, uh, an Edmonton producer. So um, IR Strategies is a producer in Edmonton who's making biochar out of um, reclaimed construction wood waste. And so this is just my research team for the summer. So that's me and a couple graduate students and a couple undergraduate students. And we basically hand, we basically, uh, working with our producer in Westlock, we used his um, silage mixing truck to mix these compost blends. And so watching graduate students climb inside a mixing truck and sweep out biochar was pretty hilarious. Uh, but we got it done. We, we made these different blends. And then we took them to three different farms in the Edmonton region. One of them was on a on an, an orthic gray luvisol soil, so formerly wooded soil. One of them was on an orthic black chernozem soil, so the highest fertility soil in, in Alberta. And one of them was on a, a solenetic soil. Um, and we wanted to look at these 13 different treatments that were replicated three times on, on each field in these small four by 10 meter plots to look at the effect on a host of different uh, data streams. And so we, we applied these different treatments at a rate of uh, four tons per, per acre, I think. Yeah, 10 tons per hectare. Um, and basically, because it's small plot work, we had to rake this stuff out, right? So we, had to, we weighed out the, the volumes. We wheelbarrowed it over to the plots. We raked it out. Um, and then the, the farmers direct seeded that uh, canola. So all three fields were in canola this year. And they basically just direct seeded it right over and they just turned off their whatever fertility management program they were using. They just turned it off on our plots. 
And then we went out and we collected samples through the growing season, including greenhouse gas measurements, um, pre and post season soil samples for fertility and microbial function and diversity. Um, and so these are the data streams that we're currently looking at. We have crop productivity, we have typical soil testing, but we're matching that with um, soil fertility using um, plant root simulator probes from a company in Western Ag in, Sas in Saskatoon has this plant simulator robe analysis. Um, we're looking at carbon stability, um, soil microbial dynamics, and greenhouse gas emissions, and with the hopes of applying this data to this sort of scoring factor cash principle and developing um, the data needed to assess soil health in Alberta. So how does this fit into precision agriculture? Well, I think that data is the backbone of precision ag and more will make it stronger. Uh, I think there will be onboard tools for directly measuring soil health in the future. I think we've seen evidence of that here today already and I've had other people reach out to me with these onboard spectroscopic analyzers for, for soil um, functional parameters. Um, so these include spectroscopic analysis of current soil conditions and instantaneous predictions of soil fertility, carbon content, and uh, stability. Uh, vari variable fertilizer inputs with other regenerative practices will ensure produ productivity and save resources and generate data on regenerative best management practices for different locations. And we need to do that, you know, in conjunction with, with um, the Living Labs research that's going on right now, RDAR in Alberta is funding a lot of this research. Um, and then trying to work with the Dash Dirt's health team. Um, so it was really, it's a combination of relationships that we're building with academics, extension agents, uh, and producers, relationships. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, that's really my goal here is to um, solicit feedback from you guys and to develop co collaborative partnerships with producers on the ground to, you know, to supply us with data and to do beta testing of the apps and the techniques and to be, um, as Chris mentioned this morning, the, that sort of um, idea of, of research and design for producers um, is gaining a lot of traction and I think it's, it's a, you know, these relationships that I'm working on with producers are um, great for me, they're really insightful for me, but they also, they give me access to um, current practices and living labs, really. And so, um, Eventually, there will be a website. So the website and newsletter for the Dash Dirt's Health app will be available by the end of this year. Um, and, and, and so what I mean by that is that I will have an email subscription portal where I, if you subscribe by email to newsletters, then I can, you can get regular updates on how the research program is progressing. Uh, but in the meantime, if you want to email me about being part of beta testing or eventually just to be part of the newsletter, um, my email address is mdm7 at ualberta.ca and it's my lab website. You can also find the Soil Plant Relations Lab. If you just Google me or the Soil Plant Relations Lab at the University of Alberta, you'll come up with both of those, my, the email address or the website address. Um, yeah, because we're really trying to, yeah, I'm, trying, I'm here to solicit um, partnerships. So just to acknowledge my funding, uh, funding partners, the University of Alberta, or RDAR, Alt Roots, the compost producer, Circle T Consulting uh, is an agronomist consulting company, and GROW is the gateway research organization, also an agronomist consulting company. Um, and, and a number of producers that I worked with have been all really helpful. So with that, I'll just take any questions. Are there uh, any questions for Derek? Or comments? Misguided? Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. your, uh, your range of testing soil organic markets look like there's been a large jump. Uh, is, I think that's a really potential good news story for uh, Western Canada in terms of carbon storage and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, that, that idea of what's being done. No, not, not yet. So it's, it's still like preliminary results and work in progress, and, but it's challenging. I mean, measuring carbon in soils is far more challenging than I think we give it credit for. Yeah. 
So, I mean, it's not surprising that a carbon economy is a bit slow to develop because, um, you know, we still need the data. We need research to show that if you use this management technique, you're going to score, store this much carbon and, we, you know, I guarantee it's there for 100 years, right? And I think that that data is missing. It's, I think it's coming and I'm hoping that this project will be a big part of, of that, uh, making that data more accessible, but we're not quite there yet. Is there, is there, um, just find the number of partners you're looking for scale-wise, what, what, what are your objectives there as far as uh, partnering with you? Yeah, that's a good question. As far as numbers of partners, I mean, really, I, I just, I'd like to make a community of, of this Dash Dirt's health app. And so, um, but we do have limitations for how many students I can put like boots on the ground um, and how many research trials we can have. But I think that um, you know, hopefully if people, if you want to email me for a newsletter for updates on this, I'm really just, I'm trying to create a community uh, of, of potential end users, so that cool. there's no limit. All right. Are there any other uh, questions? Oh, we've got one right here. Right. Yeah, so I think that um, the literature is quite clear on, on agricultural practices that are really hard on the soil, degrade the soil over time. So, so tillage, you know, so we moved to no tillage a long time, but, but even things like um, synthetic fertilizer um, and sort of bypassing that soil organic matter, plant, soil continuum. I think there's, you know, the, there's lots of evidence in literature that, that long-term management like that will degrade soil quality and soil health over time. I mean, I teach Introduction to Soil Science and I just taught the students, like yesterday I lectured about the fact that, you know, by applying synthetic fertilizer to soils, you're totally bypassing the microorganisms in the, in the field. And if, you, if we move to a management practices that, that incorporated sort of organic matter and microbial activity and roots. So the roots, the plants telling the microbes what they need and they're feeding them carbon to get what they need out of the soil, right? And so if you, if you sort of reestablish that continuum, um, you should have a more healthy soil and more, so a healthy soil should be um, more resistant to drought, more resistant to degradation, more resistant to damage. Yeah. So I think the answer is yes. The literature clearly shows that um, some forms of conventional practices degrade soil. And I, I hate to say that because I always get, I always get some, some kickback from students in the class. They're like, my family's farmers and you hate farmers and we do, we're trying to do our best. And I'm never saying that. I'm never, I'm never saying, yeah, you guys are the problem. What I'm saying is that um, some forms of management, you know, there's lots of data to show that some forms of management degrade soil health. But I don't. I think it, in, you know, if you want to look at a general overview in Alberta, I think we have great soil health here. I think we have really high functioning, high quality soils. I think you know we're blessed. Like black chernozems are some of the most fertile soil in the world, um, and we're lucky for that. Um, but that is not. A, it's not a given. You know, like that would change if we. You know, I think that that could change. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks again, Derek. Really appreciate your time. Um, great, great presentation, really enjoyed it.